I, I understand the the the, the issue, and it, it, it comes. Yes, it comes from a different use of the word mind, and sometimes we hear a phrase in the teaching, and I've used phrases like this in the past. See that the mind, thoughts and feelings and images, appears in consciousness. The mind is like a, a series of clouds that floats through the empty sky, is the traditional image. So here we're suggesting there is the mind, objective objects of thought, feeling, images, sensations, etc. And these all appear in something called consciousness, em open empty space. So here we have a distinction between mind and consciousness. And that's a valid distinction to make in the early stages of the teaching. But it can be misleading because it suggests an essential distinction or separation between the open empty space of consciousness and its content, mind. So as some of you who have been around a few years noticed, have noticed that I recently started using the word mind in a different way. Uh, in order to try and collapse the distinction between consciousness and mind. So I would now define mind as the activity of consciousness. Not an entity in its own right appearing in consciousness, but the very activity of consciousness itself. In other words, there are not two elements here. One, consciousness. Two, mind. There is just one substance present, consciousness, or this morning I refer to it as knowing. And the activity of that knowing gives rise to the, all our objective experience. So we could say mind is the activity of consciousness. We could also say that we could not even use two words, mind and consciousness. We could just say it's all mind, because all we know of experience is mind, but that the essential nature of mind, the, the, the continuous element that is present throughout all the mind's knowledge and experience, the, the essential, unconditioned, irreducible nature of mind is, we could call it, mind itself with a capital M, the essential nature of mind or original mind. Now, by calling it mind, we're not making a distinction between the essential nature of mind, unconditioned knowing, and its modulations, thoughts, sensations and perceptions. That, does that makes sense to you? It makes perfect sense, yeah. which takes me back to my first question. Okay. That awareness yeah. or knowing yeah. doesn't need mind to be aware well, of itself. But the thing is, the, you haven't understood what I've said. Because when you say does or doesn't awareness need the mind to know itself, the question implies that there is something called mind which may or may not be needed for awareness. No, all there is to mind is awareness. And awareness is self-aware. It, it, it's made out of being aware. In other words, its nature is is to be aware of itself. It cannot not be aware of itself because its nature is aware. Imagine, take the space of this room, yes, and add the quality of being aware to it. 
So imagine that the space of this room was an aware space. Yeah. Now, what would the space have to do to be aware of itself? Well, nothing at all. Perfect, that's it. That's what awareness has to do to know itself. Now, but, but let's go further. Why wouldn't it have to do anything? You, you're right, it be, wouldn't, but be, why? Because it's complete. Because its nature is being aware. It, it, it's aware of itself just by being itself. Its nature is to be aware. So awareness is like that. It, it's, it's, it's aware of itself just by being itself. It doesn't need to assume the form of mind. Remember, mind is not an, an object or an entity. Mind is the activity of awareness. Now, if awareness wants to know something other than itself, such as a world, or I should say something that seems to be other than itself, then it needs to assume the form of mind. So, does awareness need to assume the form of mind in order to know itself? No. Does it need to assume the form of mind in order to know a world? Yes. I was happier with my previous understanding, but I'm, <laughs> I'm willing to give this a bit Your of Your previous understanding was that awareness needed the mind to know itself? No, no, no. I felt great relief when it didn't. Okay. Um, it took a lot of well, What is the difference between your previous understanding well, and what Well, it took I... a lot of personal responsibility off me. It wasn't my job to go observing the world on behalf of awareness. And, and I was taking that responsibility very seriously. No, but, but you... <laughs> By which I mean your mind, yes? Because yes. all you know is your mind. Look around you now. Can you, do you ever experience anything other than the contents of your own mind? Of course not. Yeah, okay, so you are not an entity in your own right. You are the agency. You, your mind, are the, your finite mind, are the agency through which consciousness knows the world. I think this is time for Mary and Jane, isn't it? <laughs> Some of you know Mary and Jane already, but bear with me. Because this metaphor, yet another metaphor... Um, sorry if I'm giving you so many metaphors, but their metaphors are so powerful, their explanatory power is so much stronger than words. So this is a metaphor which I feel has almost more explanatory power than any other metaphor, including the screen and the image. So, Jane, Mary falls asleep in Burlingame and she dream, dreams that she is Jane on the streets of London. So, r remember, the entire dream of Jane and the streets of London takes place in Mary's mind. Yes. Now, Mary in Burlingame cannot know the streets of London. She can only know her own mind. Mary is a symbol for infinite consciousness in this metaphor. But if Mary wants to know the streets of London, she has to fall asleep to the nature of her own mind and she has to imagine that she is Jane. It is only from Jane's point of view that Mary can know the streets of London. So Mary freely overlooks the knowing of her own mind, infinite consciousness, freely overlooks the knowing of its own infinite being and assumes the form of Jane. Consciousness assumes the form of the finite mind from whose point of view it can know a world. In other words, by, com by becoming the finite mind, consciousness seems to become a separate subject of experience, from whose point of view it knows a separate object or world. Just as Mary seems to become a separate subject of experience, Jane, from whose point of view she can know the streets of London, which from Jane's point of view seem to be outside of her, but from Mary's point of view, are both the subject and object are inside her. So from each of, each of us now, uh, Jane, whatever your Christian name is, 
substitute Jane. Sorry, tell me your name again. R- Sorry. R- Mark. Richard. Mark. So um, Mary has fallen asleep and um, she has a gender change. She she's, uh, uh, dreams that she's... I can, I can Mark. be Mary. That would be <laughs> interesting. She, no, no. You're, I'm you're, open. No, no. You, you, you're, you're not Mary. You, you, are, you are Mark. Mary is dreaming. Mary has fallen asleep in New York and she's dreaming that she's Mark in Burlingame. This is a nightmare. You, you <laughs> <laughs> so, M- Mark, it, Mark's mind is the is is a limiting of Mary's mind. It is a temporary limitation of Mary's mind, which enables Mary to know Burlingame. So, from Mark's point of view, part of his experience, his thoughts and feelings, seem to take place on the inside of him. And another part of his experience, called the world, seems to take place outside of him. That is true from the point of view of Mark. Mark notices that when he closes his eyes, Burlingame disappears. When he opens his eyes again, Burlingame reappears. So Mark reasonably concludes that whatever it is that is knowing his experience, in other words, his mind, must live just behind his eyes. Every time he closes his eyes, the world disappears. So he, Mark thinks, my mind is looking out through my eyes at the world, therefore my mind must be contained in my head. But Mark's mind and everything that seems to take place inside it and everything that seems to take place outside of it all take place in Mary's indivisible mind. Now substitute Mary for infinite consciousness. In indivisible infinite consciousness is freely assuming the form of each of our minds now. So we are all, each of our minds is, is a dream in the mind, of, in the, in the mind with a capital M, in, in the infinite, indivisible consciousness. In other words, each of our minds is the agency, not the entity, the agency or the activity through which consciousness is able to realize a segment of its infinite potential. Consciousness looks through each of our finite minds and sees itself as the world. This is what the Sufis mean when they say there is only God's face. Infinite consciousness is freely assuming the form of the finite mind and through the agency of the finite mind is seeing itself as the world. And that is why William Blake said, when the doors of perception are cleansed, everything will appear to man as it is, infinite. The doors of perception are the limited, are Mark's lim- the limited view of Mark's mind. If Mark's mind, from Mark's point of view, he thinks that the limitations that he sees in the world belong to the world. He thinks the world is finite. No, it is his mind that is finite and that superimposes its limitations on what it sees. So William Blake is saying, if Mark's mind recognizes its true nature and sees, in other words, if Mark realizes that he's that his mind really belongs to Mary it's not his own finite mind then what he sees will be relieved of the limitations that his mind superimposes upon it and all of this will appear not as a multiplicity and diversity of objects but as God's face So each of our minds are like windows through which God sees itself as the world. And each of our minds realizes or actualizes a segment of God's infinite potential. God needs our mind to know itself as the world. But it doesn't need the mind to know itself as it is. It knows itself by being itself, through itself, as itself.
So does Mark go to sleep? Or does Jane wake up? Let's say that Mark gets very sick. Let's go back to this previous example. Let's say that Mark gets very sick and he feels that he's going to die. Something about the imminence of Mark's death causes him to be less interested in objective experience. He's no longer so troubled by the world and his body because he's about to die. And the imminence of his death brings about this relaxation of Mark's mind. He's no longer focused on objects, his own body, his anxieties, the world. And as a result of this, Mark's mind begins to soften and relax. It goes back, it sinks down into its source. And at a certain stage, there is this recognition. There is no such thing as Mark's mind. The mind with which Mark seems to know his experience the finite mind with which Mark seems to know his experience is just a modulation of Mary's infinite mind. That is the experience of peace. Mark thinks, I experienced peace. No, the peace is Mary's nature. But the limitations of Mark's mind due to the imminence of death, his mind has relaxed, it begins to lose its limitations and it is revealed as Mary's infinite inherently peaceful mind. That's what the experience of peace and happiness are. It is. It's the, it's the recognition that our minds are Mary's mind. Our finite minds are only modulations of infinite, indivisible, inherently peaceful consciousness. And certain experiences of the finite mind have the power to uh, precipitate this recognition and, and the imminence of death is one of them. That is why people like extreme sports, for instance. Because when we undertake extreme sports, the, 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 the finite mind is voluntarily putting itself in a situation where it is faced with the fear of death. And that, that terror that it feels as you're plunging on your bungee jump or, or whatever it is, that terror elicits the same relaxation of the mind. The mind returns temporarily to its source and there is this consciousness. Exactly. You, you get this... 60 miles an hour. Yeah, exactly. It's why people do it. It's, it, it because you, you're basically, you're putting yourself through the death process and you're, you're in a rather forceful way, you are, you're, you're, you're forcing Jane to wake up and realize, I'm Mary. That's what the experience of peace is. That's why people practice extreme sports. That's just one example of it. That they're eliciting the fear of death in order to precipitate this experience of peace. It's the only reason we do it. Meditation is exactly the same process. But, but, but safer. Yes. Yes. But, but what is the impulse? There are many examples of this. I, I, I told this story recently, but unless you've all been watching YouTube or subscribing to my downloads. You, uh, most of you won't have heard it, so I'll, I'll tell it again briefly. I was uh, shortly before, when I last did a meeting in Amsterdam, I did a weekend in meeting in Amsterdam, and I came a day early and met a friend of mine, Bernardo Kastrup, and we were, uh, he, he said, Rupert, I want to show you a, a, an aspect of Amsterdam which I don't think you've ever seen before. You just go from your nice hotel to your bicycle along the canals to the meeting room and, and, and back again. He said, I'm going to take you north and show you the other side of Amsterdam. So we walked. It was King's Day, so there was a fair. And there was one of these bungee jumps. People, kids going up to the top 
I don't I know how it, how it, how it was, probably, um, I don't know, 30, 40 metres, getting into this capsule, and then the capsule was just plummeting to the ground, but it was held on two pieces of, of, of rubber, so just before it hit the ground, whatever, th three metres, they were catapulted back up again, and they went up and down like, that, like, like this. So th they were precipitating the fear of death. They were checking that it was safe, but they were putting themselves as close to the death process as they could precisely to elicit this rush of peace. So we went from there. We then walked on. There was a church. We went to a church and there was a mass going on. And people were taking, uh, having mass. And it, it occurred to me that they were doing it for the same reason. In this case, they were surrendering themselves to God. But what they were really doing in surrendering everything to God was letting go of everything. Letting go of the anxieties, the concerns, the fears. In other words, they were doing this in order to access God's presence. The inherent peace of awareness in which we move and live and have our being. And then we walked on. We stopped at a cafe, we had a beer on the street and there were lots of people, it was a sunny day, there were lots of people on the street and I noticed again, I had, you have your first sip of beer, you notice the effect that it has on the mind and I thought, the reason that everybody is sitting here having a glass of beer is because with those first few sips there is this relaxation of the mind. Your troubles no longer seem so troublesome, your problems are no longer so problematic. In other words, the first few sips of beer, you get this relaxation of the mind. As the mind relaxes, the peace in the background of the mind begins to shine. And so I noticed as we were walking through Amsterdam, everyone is engaging on the, in these different activities for the same reason. Anyway, we were walking around the circle and then Bernard said to me, okay, we're now going to walk back through the red light district back to your hotel. So he, he took me to, through Two or three of these streets, I'm sure none of you have ever been to the red light district in Amsterdam, so I'll describe them very, very, very briefly for you. <laughs> these, these narrow streets with, with, with glass panes, glass doors, all the way along the street with almost naked women in, in, each, in each cubicle with, with, a, with a glass front. Um, let's just say being very inviting and suggestive. It's, and so we walked along and we saw all these people, the, these men looking around, looking sheepish and, and groups of men and uh, people going up to the door and then the, the, the curtain closing. And we witnessed all of this and I realized people are doing this. These guys are, 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 are going to these prostitutes for exactly the same experience because there, it, it, there is a moment when they feel they lose themselves. And in that moment of completely losing themselves in the other, their anxieties, their fears, their concerns, all disappear and, surprise, surprise, the peace of awareness shines. And then the last stop on the way home, he took me to what's called a, a head shop, where in Amsterdam they sell all kinds of substances. and 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 And... Again, same thing. Why do people take these substances? Because the, the object-focused uh, mind is relaxed. So all these activities, as we were walking through the streets, all these different activities, they were only being engaged in for one reason alone, to precipitate this experience of peace, to, to, to unveil the peace that stands at the back of the mind, but that seems to be absent when the mind is directed towards objects. So this peace in the background of the mind is the essential nature of the mind. It's not another substance. It is the, the, the essential, irreducible, undisappearable nature of mind. J. 
Jane engages in all these activities simply to bring her finite mind to an end and to have the recognition. It's Mary's recognition because Mary is the only one present in Jane's mind. For, for Mary to recognize herself again. Oh, I'm Mary. I've woken up from the dream of separation. The only reason Jane engages in each of these activities is for Mary to recognize her mind again the nature of her mind. In other words, Mary's mind is only known by Mary's mind. That is why the Sufis say, I knew my Lord through my Lord. There is no self other than infinite consciousness. Infinite consciousness is the only self, if we can call it a self, that there is. There is no question of infinite consciousness being known by anything other than itself because there is no other than itself. <laughs>